Will you turn with me today in your Bible to Acts chapter 2? And if you don't have a Bible, then uh, as I normally do, I recommend that you write down the Scripture references. We've been talking about some signs, and uh, uh, we saw in uh, last week and the, and the previous class that uh, uh, the sign uh, of the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and so, and, uh, so forth in a manger had to do with Jesus Christ as the king. Uh, the heir to the throne of David. Uh, Jesus Christ was born as the king. In fact, uh, in, uh, in um, Isaiah chapter 9, listen to what the scripture says. Isaiah 9 verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, so forth and so on. Uh, when the wise men came uh, to, the, to see the babe, they said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star, and we're come to worship him, and on and on. So the sign had to do with the king. In uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, God said, uh, in effect, okay, I'll give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel and on and on and on. Well, uh, this virgin did bear this child. This virgin is uh, Mary and the child is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and lay him in a manger and God said, that's a sign unto you. Now, I want to talk to you today about a different sign. Um, and I want you to notice some things now that are very specific and they're very clear uh, pertaining to Jesus Christ as the King of Israel as compared to Jesus Christ as the Savior of the Gentiles. Notice in Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching. In Acts chapter 2 verse 25, Peter at Pentecost said, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. That is, hope of the resurrection. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And then he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the prophet uh, of the patriot David that he's both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching salvation at the second coming of Christ. And he's preaching the second coming of Christ being the coming in power and great glory. And he's preaching it as in Zechariah chapter 12 and 13. In Zechariah chapter 13, the context is the coming of the Lord. He said that a fountain shall be opened unto you at that day for sin and for uncleanliness. If I put on the board up here and I say, okay, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is back here. <clears throat> now, when Jesus Christ was born back here, he's born king of the Jews, but Israel rejected the king. The teaching of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pertains to him as being the king. It pertains to him as the one that's going to reign, and it pertains to his warning to the people that I'm coming again. Be ready, for in an hour when you think not, the Son of Man cometh, and on and on and on. He's referred to as the Son of Man, uh, I believe it's 81 to 83 times or something like that in the Scriptures. And each time that he's referred to as the Son of Man, it has to do with his earthly ministry. But never does Paul refer to him as the Son of Man. <clears throat> he refers to him as the Son of God. So they rejected the king. They said, we have no king but Caesar. They said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. Let him be crucified. And so he was crucified. Then after his crucifixion on the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches unto them, and he preaches unto them a murder indictment for having 
slain him, having rejected him, and so forth. And then he tells the things that we just read in Acts chapter 2. And he says there that God raised him up to sit on his throne. Now when, to sit on David's throne. And when they said, what must we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19, he said, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of oppression shall come from the presence of the Lord. Say that here is the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter's message there is repent and be baptized for remission of sins. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19, uh, he says, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of oppression shall come from the presence of the Lord. So I know then that the 3,000 of Acts chapter 2 and the 5,000 of Acts chapter 4 and so forth, I know that they looked for their sins to be wiped out and done away with when the fountain was opened unto them of Zechariah chapter uh, chapter 13 verse 1 and the time when all Israel would be saved as it is written, uh, uh, the deliverer shall roar out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. God said, that's my covenant of them when I shall take away their sins. So in 1 John 1, 9, the passage is, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people in the tribulation over there. They confess their sins looking forward to their sins being wiped out at the second coming of Christ. Now my point is, Christ is the king of Israel. Christ is the one that's heir to the throne of David. Turn back in your Bible please to Isaiah and notice in Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Notice in verse 5. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, on and on and on. Now verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not, and my glory will I not give to another. Come to uh, chapter 43 verse 3. Isaiah 43, verse 3, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, uh, thy Savior. Come to uh, verse 14. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Uh, Come to verse uh, 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Uh, Verse uh, 6, chapter 44, verse 6, I'm sorry. Verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I'm the first, I'm the last, and beside me there is no God. Verse 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from the time, and have declared it? Uh, you are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any, and on and on. It is unmistakable. It is absolute. It is positive. If you believe the Bible, then you have to know that Jesus Christ is the manifestation of Almighty God in the flesh, and Israel rejected God, their King. They rejected Christ, their Lord, and they said, Crucify Him. We'll not have the man to reign over us. And so Christ went to Calvary and died. Now, when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, what's Peter going to preach? Is he going to preach? Well, uh, Jesus Christ, in effect, really was uh, dying for all the the, uh, Gentiles around the world and everything. No, that's not what he preaches at all. He preaches a message proven to them, this is your king. You have crucified the holy and the just one. You have put to death the king of Israel. You have denied your king, the one that's heir to the throne of David. And so they said, what must we do? He said, repent and be baptized. That is, repent and be identified with him in water baptism 
looking for salvation at the coming of the Lord. How do I know that's what he's saying? Because of chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When would their sins be blotted out? When Christ comes again. When will Christ come again? Not until after the tribulation. So the wise men came from the east and they said, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we're come to worship him. Jesus Christ is born, the king of the Jews. Now he was going to die. That child was born to die. And so he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. He's laid in a box, somewhat like a casket, I guess. It's called a crib. You know, like a place where you keep feed. Like when I was a boy on the farm, we had a corn crib. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> you city people, you probably don't know anything about a crib. You, the only thing you know about a crib is a place to lay a baby. Did you ever connect the baby in a crib as to a place where he's fed or something like that? You ever? Well, I guess not. A manger is a crib. The crib's a manger. It's a place where feed is kept, and in some cases where animals feed, where they eat. Crib, and in many cases it's like a it's like a long oblong box, and in days gone by it was called a feeding trough. But then I wouldn't expect people to know that today because most people don't have sense enough to know what's going on anyway. Sorry about that. So you're a real smart aleck. <laughs> well, maybe it's because I'm uneducated. Hey, uh, you know, there are things that people learn on a farm that you can't learn in the biggest college in America today. When I was 20, 21 years of age, I could take a carburetor apart and put it back together again. I could pull an engine down and rebuild the engine and put it back together again. I could take machinery apart and rebuild it and put it back together again. There are people with doctorate degrees and whatever across America today. They wouldn't even know what a carburetor is. They wouldn't even know how to change a spare. that They couldn't put on a spare tire. They're educated out of their sense. There are people today with a big education that couldn't walk through the woods without bumping into the trees. They wouldn't know the difference. That's mean. No, that's just telling the truth. Now, Jesus Christ, though, even though Peter said he was raised up to sit on David's throne, and he will sit on David's throne, but he didn't sit on David's throne when they thought that he would. So there was something in between the preaching of Peter back there in Acts 2 and 3 and the tribulation and second coming of Christ called a mystery. In fact, the time itself is referred to as a mystery in Colossians chapter 1. And it's a period of time committed to the Apostle Paul that he wrote in the Scripture to fill up the Word of God. In other words, if you read from Genesis over to a point here, I'll call it the book of Acts, and started with Hebrews over here, you wouldn't have the completed Word of God. Why? Well, there's some people that God chose in Christ before the foundation of the world, and they certainly are not referred to in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus Christ told the apostle, don't even go to the Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when God Almighty calls Peter to go to Cornelius' house, he doesn't even want to go. And when he got there, he said, it's an unlawful thing for a man that says, you to keep company or coming to one of another nation. But then who believes the Bible anyway? There is a mystery in there, folks. I heard a preacher from here in Pensacola one Sunday morning on his regular broadcast, and he got so carried away with a thing about the mystery and about us that talk about it that he just went berserk saying, mm, they say the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. <laughs> yes, we do. You know why we refer to it as the mystery? Bless God, that's what it is. 
and it's a mystery that still remains a mystery to a lot of people who think they know the mystery. God gave Israel a sign pertaining to their king. But there is some other sign. But never notice comparison between Acts chapter 2, verse 30, and what Paul says about the resurrection of Christ in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, re, uh, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. <laughs> now, it's pretty strong when you think about it. Verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, let's notice what he didn't say. In verse 7, Consider what Peter, James, and John had to say, and the Lord will give you understanding. Verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ, or the seed of David, is raised from the dead according to Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2. No way does he say anything like that. In fact, he does not exalt the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to sit on David's throne. He exalts the fact that Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead had to do with power. And he saw that as such power, so tremendous power, that he wanted to know it. Look in Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, notice in verse, uh, he, he tells the people, if you think you've got something to brag about, I've got more. And he lists all the things that he could boast in. Now verse 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now watch, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, on and on and on. Now, I heard a preacher from Fort Worth, Texas the other day on his television broadcast, and he got to this verse right here, and he went into some big deal there about all this mighty power in the lives of preachers. <laughs> You know, it's so wild when you think about it. You watch these fellows, you know, and they put their hands on somebody's head and they get their head, their face all out of shape and they start talking to the devil. And they begin to rebuke Satan and I rebuke thee in the name of the Lord. Come out of this individual and all that kind of nonsense. And then they lay hands on somebody and they fall out on the floor and there's always somebody to catch them. And they talk about this mighty power in them. Well, you see, if you look at that in the light of this passage, that is absolutely ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Why, when Paul wrote this passage here, he had already healed more people than Benny Hinn ever even thought about. When Paul wrote this passage here, he had had fellowship in the sufferings of Christ, tremendous sufferings on and on. When Paul wrote this passage, he had confessed Christ for years. Isn't this a strange thing for a man that's about ready to pass off and turn his minister over to somebody else to say that I may know him? and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. We're talking about a man that wrote to the Corinthians and said, I was pressed out of man. Why, he said, I, it was like death. I was about to die. We're talking about a man that was stoned so severely they dragged him out of the town, threw him down out there thinking he's dead. And he got up and walked again. <laughs> It's really something, isn't it? For a man that's gone through all that to say, I've counted all this stuff that I could brag about as nothing but dung. Why? That I may know him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection. 
Well, what is this power of his resurrection that he wants to know? It certainly doesn't have anything to do with any power working in him. He certainly has no motivation for him. This man was, I mean, if he's not motivated, you might as well give it up. I mean, you can read John Doe's book and then look in the mirror and say, you're the greatest until hell freezes over. And that won't motivate you if what Paul had wouldn't motivate you. I mean, this man was motivated, folks. I mean, you know, the first thing he said was, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And he got on with it. And yet here at the close of his ministry, nearing the close, he said, I've counted all that I could boast about as nothing but dung. I want to know the Lord. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. So, okay, then he wants to know, he wants this power in himself. No. It had nothing to do with having the power to lay hands on somebody and heal them. It had nothing to do with all that. It's another kind of power. Notice in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, written in his prison ministry, as was Philippians. Verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. You need to know Him. You need to know Him. You need to have knowledge of Him. Not knowledge of his ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Him. The man himself. The Christ. The Lord. The Savior. The manifestation of God Almighty. Seated in heaven right now. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Not guess at not read somebody's book on 88 reasons the rapture is going to come in 88 and get all upset about it and all shook up about it. Not get all crossed up because you heard a fellow on Blab TV or some such thing back a few years ago say the Lord will come by 1993. <laughs> and he didn't. I heard that man say that, a preacher, a local preacher here. That's what he said. I listened to him. Well, the Lord didn't come. No. Paul's praying that they may, their eyes of understanding being enlightened, they may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body and on and on. That's power, folks. That's power above all authority. That's power above all might and dominion. That's power above Satan and all his demoniac powers. That's power above it all, beloved. And that's the place that every believer today that trusts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is seated right now with him. You see there are some of you, you don't believe God Almighty had the power to do what he did. What did Jesus Christ do? Well, the Bible said that he was made to be sin. Jesus Christ, the sinless, virgin-born Son of Almighty God, was made sin. What in the world is he talking about? Why, on the other hand, he said that he died for our sins. This is a verb. That's a noun. So what is all that about? Jesus Christ, the virgin-born Son of Almighty God, who had no sin. He said, which of you convinceth me of sin? Jesus Christ had no sin by inheritance. Almighty God overshadowed Mary 
and Mary conceived by the Holy Ghost, and a child of God was born, the Son of God was born by a virgin birth. And so he had no sin. And the Bible said he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. And I don't know but what people get the thing all crossed around because they got their eyes so blinded by looking at what people do, they can't see what people are. You see, Jesus Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, but he had no sin dwelling in him. He had no sin in him. He had no nature to do wrong, and yet he was tempted. Boy, that is a mystery, isn't it? Why don't you work that one out? He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He didn't say yet without committing sin. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so the Bible said God made him to be sin for us. So on Calvary, he became on Calvary what you are by nature. You got a mean and ornery disposition about you. You got an attitude about you that's bad. You got a heart in you that's wicked. The Bible says that your heart is uh, evil above all things and desperately wicked and that you can't know it. And the Bible said there's none good and the Bible said there's none that doeth good and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and on and on. You're a mess, you know that? I mean, you people that have gone to the altar and repented of your sins and confessed your sins and laid your sins on the altar and whatever, how about your sin that is in you? How about that sin that dwells in you? What are you going to do about that? So when Jesus Christ died on Calvary, he became sin, and the wages of sin is death. The context, Romans chapter 6, Romans 5, by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. So whatever you are by nature is going to cause you to die. So when Jesus Christ died, he eradicated that. He did away with that. It's gone now. You don't have to die as a result of the sin that is in you. Why? Jesus Christ took your place in death for sin and was made sin that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus Christ was buried and God Almighty raised him from the dead as proof to you that if you will trust him as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to worry about being raised from the dead. God Almighty showed you his power, the power of his resurrection in raising Christ from the dead who died for your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Next week, Lord willing, we'll continue with this same subject. Till then, good day.